the professor of engineering psychology <coughs> at West Point. Um, he's a soldier who served in operational deployments in Kuwait and uh, Iraq, as well as a scholar. Um, his current researches include um, expert decision making in high stress environments and the role of multimodal displays in combat environments. He's probably the most, uh, the proudest of his third role as a snowboard instructor, as you will see in his first couple of slides. I introduce Colonel Malloy. So, slide changing. Did I miss the uh, remote? Somebody took the remote with them. Awesome. Okay, so uh, I have to thank I have to thank a lot of people. First, people I want to thank is uh, the guys who delayed coming out here uh, last night. We didn't get into about two thirty this morning because uh, I am a snowboard instructor, and, and just to kind of give you the whole idea about West Point, it is high adventure, high op tempo, high stress all the time. And uh, I was teaching snowboarding, and it was the day they graduated. So this was last night. You can go to the next slide. Uh, next, I guess I can go to the next slide. Last night they graduated. So the cadets, when we, we train the kids, we actually then wear our, they wear their full dress uniform to ski down the mountain with the kids last night. So we were snow, snowboarding down the mountain. And you talk about high stress. If I would have crashed, this is the same uniform that I was wearing last night at, at 7 o'clock. So we didn't get in. I, I appreciate my colleagues waiting on me, and we didn't get in until about early this morning. Uh, but that, anyway, that's what, uh, that's what we did last night. What does that have to do with anything? Well, I'm very interested in uh, multimodality. Uh, and I got some uh, advice from my uh, advisor, my old advisor. I guess he's always my advisor. As I was walking up here, he said, hey, make sure that you get dock, uh, your docket on the, uh, the billet. Make sure that you're going after lunch when the circadian rhythms are the lowest. And so I made sure I got it after lunch. He said, also, uh, use lots of, you know, if you don't want a lot of questions, use lots of acronyms. And uh, so I'll do that. And he said, make sure that, uh, you know, we will both do the brief. You said, and I, he said, how do you want to break it up? So I said, all right, well, I'll do the brief. You take the questions. So uh, that's, that's what we're going to do. Um, so cadets, we were just kidding about what was testable, but actually everything I talk about today will be testable. OK. Um, so amount of sensors on the battlefield. What I want to do is I'm going to talk in the bigger picture first. I'm actually going to talk uh, large organizations, then a little bit smaller organizations, then I'm going to talk about the individual soldier. Uh, and hopefully everything I talk about will be related to the things that, uh, talk, that uh, people talked about earlier. And we are very thankful. I, I wanted to go ahead and, uh, and get this out front. We're very thankful for our relationship with the University of Texas. I am not a professor of engineering psychology, but I do work for a professor of engineering psychology, Dr. Matthews. And uh, I do appreciate you putting that in the, the bulletin, though. I'll show my kids. Uh, we're very fortunate to be working with the University of Texas because we're absolutely interested in, in the uh, phenomena that they're looking at. I also want to thank very much uh, guys like Mike Barnes with ARL HRED, uh, guys like Elmar Schmeiser, who have really supported us in a lot of the research that we're doing. Uh, that, and it'll, a lot of it we'll, I'll cover today. Um, the amount of data or the amount of sensors that are out there are greater than ever before. And I would tell you that every day, the amount of information that we have available to give this soldier is absolutely, it's not even, it's beyond exponential. It's infinitely more information than we could ever handle. And what's interesting is the connectivity is also increasing at that same rate. So we can get more information, but we also now can pass more information. Um, and everybody probably needs to know the information, at least what's relative to them in their area of operation, be it, <clears throat> be it based on time or event or whatever the case may be. So what we've done is we just keep using the sensors that we know how to use. So for example, this is actually taken out of an operations center. Um, I'm not sure that this is feasible. I, I think we were trying to look. I think uh, Missy said we could handle up to uh, 11 to 12 displays or 11 to 12 events. Uh, I think we've exceeded that with the, the 14 to 17 displays that are at least in the, the immediate field of view, uh, not to mention the peripheral vision here. So the answer is we'll just keep displaying the information. We can always just keep buying more displays. The problem is visual displays are going to be limited. Auditory displays are going to be limited. And that's really the two resources that we've been mostly using. Uh, what's exciting is that the technology, as it's advancing, we're able to start doing things now in, in multiple modalities both visual and auditory. And what I'm going to present at the end of my briefing today is also through the sense of touch. Obviously, everything we do is in extreme environments. Uh, I think we talked about sleep deprivation. We do get sleep in the Army. I don't know why everybody keeps saying we don't. We, we have plenty of, 
There's opportunities, in fact, that you don't have to tell a soldier to sleep. They will get sleep. Unfortunately, it sometimes lacks both in quantity and quality. The problem is, is we have this great technology. It's never, it's seldom does it get a chance to be integrated before it's already deployed. So we use sort of this Christmas tree approach. Uh, Specialist Bowman actually jumped in to the northern part of Iraq uh, when we were denied access uh, through, uh, through the country of Turkey. Uh, he actually then deployed, uh, jumped in, uh, was a pathfinder, one of the first guys on the ground. His equipment weighed almost as much as his body weight. So his manifested weight as he jumped out of the airplane while in flight was almost twice his normal body weight. Um, so all the things that we've talked about today within sleep deprivation, all the things we've talked about between physical stress, this is why we have to be so concerned about this because, oh, by the way, at all the things that he was off, obviously off of his time zone for circadian rhythm disruption, obviously physically exhausted. I don't think he's looking for a lot of enemy right now. I think he's looking for some air. He's obviously at a higher altitude. He's cold. I can go on and on and on, but he's also scared. You add all those parameters in there and all the research that we're doing summed up, you know, we think about George Miller's 1956 study, the magic number seven plus or minus two. I'm not sure for this young man right here, that magic number might be three plus or minus two for the size, of, for example, of his working memory. So I want to talk about how are we now sharing this information. So I said I'm going to start at the highest level. We're very lucky when I was in Iraq, I worked for General Corelli, who's now the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army. We have seen some great advances in the technology to be able to share information in real time. So being able to sh share that information to make sure we're all on the same sheet of music. And this is where the whole idea of multimodality comes in. We can do lots of things on PowerPoint where we can give elaborate presentations and neat builds and add extra text. But what we now can do based on the speed of connectivity and this great DARPA project called Command Boats of the Future, which now is actually a field of army uh, of record project, we can draw on a map, we can write music while somebody's actually looking at the sheet of music that we're writing it on. So now, not only are we on the same sheet of music, I'm showing you what note I'm singing. So literally, in my brigade talk, or the brigade talk that I worked in, as I was able to draw on the map, the other brigade talks could at the same time see any changes in information that were going on. As we had contacts, we, uh, enemy contact, we were able to then deconflict things like field artillery, like the shadow, like all these other things that were going on, we could do it simultaneously, therefore limiting our working memory requirements, our long-term memory requirements, because unfortunately I do represent that soldier after 360 days that had a lower working memory, who had a problems with his long-term memory, probably had a shrunken corpus callosum at that point. I probably had corpus callosum envy for sure. Uh, no, it wasn't wherever the, the uh, I forget the structure that we just talked about that shrank under sleep deprivation. The point being, these technological advances were very simple. We were using multimodality. We were using both sight and sound. We were narrowing attention to the place that it needed to be to stop the, the errors that we were having within communication that we've had in years past. I've done 13 training center rotations. I have never been able to fire artillery, even notionally, across a boundary. Before I left Iraq, we were able to fire artillery across a boundary in troops in contact in less than a minute. Never have been able to do it in training in 13 training center rotations. Did it under a minute in combat, thanks to the fact that we're finally starting to see the benefits of multimodality and real-time synchronous collaborative sharing. Okay, uh, this was the example that I gave. This is actually a, a, a not a non-classified example of how one might be able to do a mission, how one might be able to share information. That's both now spatially relevant, temporally relevant, and can be done real time across the battlefield where we literally didn't have to then join each other to, be, to talk about things at the same place, same time. We could do it while being at remote stations. Now, that's neat for the higher echelon who had great connectivity, great light, all those magnanimous number of displays that I, that I showed you earlier. But what about for the smaller groups of soldiers? Well, we've made advances there too. In the last 24 months, we've seen the prolification of TigerNet. TigerNet now allows asynchronous collaboration between the smaller units. So now detailed multimodal information again, where we can use pictures, time, space, geographically referenced photographs to where patrol units can now get that information, not real, not real time, but near real time, 
that's pertinent based on geographical location, it's pertinent based on the uh, people that someone's meeting, based on enemy tactics, techniques, procedures, and now they're able to modify theirs. Okay, not satisfied with that. So now, what you'll, if you get a chance to go to the poster session tonight, which I hope everyone can, you'll get to see what Nate's going to present, which is, for example, how to now take this type of asynchronous communication and move it up even the next notch. So Nate took things like PowerPoint. We're working with some contractors right now to push a project that allows you, again, to be able to use more natural type language. For example, my natural gestures to be captured onto an automated display, taking things like TigerNet data, and now, again, thwarting that communication gap, allowing people to, to naturally, freely discuss a tactical operation, a, a, a enemy procedure, and then uh, advance. And what you'll find Nate found, I'm going to steal part of his thunder, what we found was when we could allow people to more naturally co collaborate in this multimodal format, meaning using pictures and voice and gesture, and now there's some neat algorithms that are being done by our programmer, which is literally making it where it's shrunk down. It's not big like a PowerPoint. It's much smaller. It's more like a wave file. I digress. The point is what Nate found was people actually were using more information, bigger words. Infantrymen won't use big words if they have to spell them, but if they can just say them and naturally draw, they'll use infinitely more time, more detail in their instructions. And Nate found that very quickly in a, in a study that he did. Additionally, Darquette will talk to you, Cadet Darquette will talk to you about a study where we're actually starting to capture gestures to, act, to use them in communication. Capturing gestures to where we can find out what a soldier's doing on the battlefield and now capture that data so that it can now go into any means. It could go into an auditory means, a visual means, or a tactile means, which is where I'm going to go to my next slide. But one last thing. I make this seem easy. It's not easy. All these networks are extremely sophisticated. They run on a very, very powerful backbone that is extremely complicated. And I think, uh, I think it was Rebecca who said, the more complicated it is, the easier it is to break. And that's absolutely true. We have information that's secret. We have information that's top secret. We have information that's FOUO for official use only. We have information that everybody can know. Then we have the information that the media puts out. All different sources of information trying to be shared on the same network. It's not possible. It has in, in certain information. We literally will have computers in our tactical operations center that one computer cannot talk to another computer. Physically, to move the information, you have to read the screen and retype it onto the other computer. So there's some serious challenges that we have to try to bring, this, bring all this together, and we're trying to do it again in the preface of sleep deprived, scared, fatigued, exhausted soldier. Okay. So what is the answer to move all this information, all this different uh, content that we have? It's going to be about presenting. Do we present that information binocular, helmet-mounted displays? Actually, I did a lot of my master's work on. I'm very fascinated by the fact that we feel we can take it one of the infantrymen's eyes away. People have a, a huge problem moving with, with only one eye. Maybe they'll learn. We're, we're getting there, though. Slowly, we're able to do things. Aviation's been able to do heads-up displays for quite some time. So the technology will catch up. Doesn't mean we can't not try to progress to moving things uh, in front of the infantryman's eye. But I think we do have to be careful that when we, we create, ask a soldier, uh, him or her, to move in a monocular, in a biocular world or binocular world, monocularly, it's very difficult. Okay. So one of the ways that we're looking at is what about using tactile? And so uh, my work with uh, Dr. Hancock at UCF focused largely on the sense of touch. Dr. Matthews told me that we used to be called the touchy feely department in the behavioral sciences and leadership, so I'm trying to bring the touchy back into it. So we looked, and, and this is not new technology. People have been using tactile, the, the, the haptic sense for some time. In fact, the research goes 40, 50 year, years back to Geldart actually had created a language for the skin. Obviously, Braille works very well for people without sight. Uh, there's a problem, though. It's been very difficult. With, there's been some technology cul-de-sacs, but it's very difficult to get people to learn Braille that have sight. We like our eyes. We love our ears. They're very rich, very large bandwidth instruments or senses that allow us to, to traffic a lot of information. So we had to be careful. We watched the, the cul-de-sacs based on technology. We watched the cul-de-sacs used with bad implementation, which someone actually talked about earlier, things that didn't have the right acronym. And so we've watched tactile kind of come and go over the last 50 years. But we are seeing a reinsurgence with it, with technology. Your cell phone, by, now, 
Here's where I'm going to jump out of my infantry skin for a second and get into my scientific skin. Your cell phone vibrates at 60 hertz deep inside your, your dermis where the vi actual vaccinian corpuscle is located, which is that part of your skin which feels vibrations. You're, it has a resonant frequency. So you like to feel vibrations or you most readily feel vibrations at about 250 hertz. That's about the sweet spot between 200 and 300 hertz. That's the resonant frequency of that, of that corpuscle. Your cell phone vibrator vibrates at 60 hertz. It whispers to the skin. When you're walking, you're probably not going to feel your cell phone ring. It's also not loaded, or you're not going to feel your cell phone vibrate. However, a lot of us, especially old people like me who can't hear high frequencies, we put our cell phone on vibrate and ring. Now, I, obviously, I don't do that here. I just have it on vibrate, so you don't know when I'm getting that call. But when I'm out just walking around, I have it both on ring and vibrate because for some reason, I can hear my phone better when I can also feel it. We love multimodality. When you can't hear me talk, obviously you can hear me very well here, but out, outside, if you can't hear me, you'll tend to watch my lips. Now, none of us are lip readers, or are we? It seems that when you look at someone's lips, you actually can understand and hear them better than when you're not looking at their lips. We love multimodality. Now, this technology is allowing us to create better tactors. This tactor actually will vibrate at 250, it can be tuned to vibrate at 250 hertz, which is actually screaming to the skin. Doesn't hurt, but you can feel it. Has a very quick onset frequency. Your cell phone takes about 60 milliseconds. Now, not a lot of time between us friends, but still takes about 60 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds to get the frequency. This, this tactile vibrator can get up to frequency in five milliseconds instantaneously, not perceptible. Um, it can be concentrated, it can be put against the skin, also it can be hardened. We actually, this technology was done for Navy SEALs. Okay. So what can we do with tactile displays? Well, we know if we tap people on the shoulder, we can get their attention oriented to a certain location in space very quickly. We know that the strength of some of these displays that I talked about earlier, these visual displays, was localizing attention. So it seems that one of the things about multimodality is that it really helps us focus and orient our attention. So we thought, hey, maybe tactile will be good at spatial. In fact, the literature talks for the last 50 years that it's very good for orient orienting one's attention in space. So we did. Lot, there's lots of studies out there talked about what's the right number of tactors. How can you do it? We started with eight. Uh, there's very good resolution with eight tactors. We just put them around a belt. And what's kind of neat about eight is there's four cardinal directions and four intracardinal directions. Hence eight. Plus, I'm a big George Miller fan, right? So seven plus or minus two, eight was right there in the middle. So we ran with that number. So with eight tactors, we now could orient people's attention in space. Well, guess what? All those sensors that I talked about, we've had the ability over the last 20 years to tell you if there was, last 20 years, last 30 years, to be able to tell you if there was artillery coming into the location you were sit standing. We've been able to tell since the Gulf War, since pre-Gulf War, of, of fire, direction firing, uh, fire direction radar. So we can tell you you're getting ready to get hit by artillery. Well, let me tell you what that looked like 25 years ago. Looks like where Merlot's at is getting ready to be hit by artillery. Might want, let's call them very quickly. So by the time we figure out how, what frequency you can call to get to my unit, you call down there and you say, oh, by the way, guys, you're getting ready to get hit by artillery. We say, yeah, we know. We need you to send a medevac. Because it's already happened. You don't have a limited amount of time of flight for the, for the round to come up. Well, now we actually have the connectivity that we can send you that information. We can send each and every individual soldier the information, hey, there's artillery coming in. Okay, so you look at your display, your Palm Pilot, and you say, artillery's coming in, and you look up, and sure enough, you'll see it coming in. Because you got now the time to mentally rotate, the time to read the lesson, to read the message. So what would happen if I just told you, what if I gave you spider sense that has to tingle, and I tell you, run as fast as you can in this direction, and you'll get out of harm's way. I don't want to tell you why, but just trust me. Run in this direction as fast as you can, and you'll get out of harm's way. This is starting to get exciting, because the sensors are there, the ability to move the information is there. The question is now, can we display that information where it could effectively be used? So we jumped on this. We started messing around with it. It worked very, very well for navigation. In fact, with an electronic compass and some other high-speed innovations, we can have you plug in your GPS information, put your GPS in your pocket, and start running. And the tactile display will tell you where to go. And it'll take you right where you wanted to go. Pretty neat idea. Still not convinced, though, because now I've lost all my situation of where I am specifically on the battlefield. I just know which direction to go. Sort of the difference in the way we talked about the instructions on Google Earth 
whether you're looking at the map or whether you're just looking at the turn by turn instructions. So I wasn't convinced yet. So we said, hey, can we push this even further? What if we can give it more information? So we started looking at the idea of languaging. And we found that largely, for example, arm and hand signals are spatial information. You're not going to believe this, but in the military, we have an arm and hand signal for attention. It looks something like this. In the civilian world, it looks something like this. <laughs> now, we have some more specific ones. I don't think in the, uh, in the civilian world you ever say, hey, let's go rally up. Uh, but we, so there's attention. Well, in the in this Army, we say rally, which means they were going to meet up somewhere. And that's the arm and hand signal for that. Those are largely spatial. I mean, they're absolutely spatial. You're mapping my movement, making a spatial reference to it. So we could talk about your processing it in the occipital lobe, and then it's going into maybe the parietal lobe, which is more geographic locate. You know, so I, I could go through all that. In fact, hopefully, eventually, we're going to be able to do all this and figure this out. But here's what's neat. I can make you feel that using this, the phi phenomena, moving tactors on and off at a certain uh, flicker rate or a certain frequency, a certain uh, stimulus onset interval, an inner stimulus interval, I can make tactors do just like lights do on a marquee. I can make them move. So I can make you feel attention. I can make you feel rally. Actually, rally feels pretty cool. <laughs> so it worked. We took some college freshmen. Uh, in fact, I've got it. I'm going to, well, I'm going to back up. I, no, I can't back up. So I'm going to stay on this study. So we took some college freshmen. We were able to teach them arm and hand signals very quickly. We took some West Point cadets. We could teach them even quicker because, oh, by the way, the West Point cadets already knew the arm and hand signals. So let me go ahead and go to the next slide because and, and, I want to talk specifically about a study we did. But when I came into the lab, this is kind of what, where they were at. And I was like, hey, that's great. But look at the last 50 years. It always hit a cul-de-sac because what works in the lab doesn't necessarily work in the field. So I asked Dr. Hancock, give me a year to go do some field studies. He said, I'll give you six months. So in six months' time, we ran three major studies to make sure this thing would work in the field before I was willing to put any intellectual capital into it. So we went to West Point, and uh, as the guys from UT will tell you, it's just a great place to work because each time I put a cadet on the treadmill, I would tell the one that was next, hey, guess how fast she ran. <laughs> and then the next one would try to run faster. You get the idea. I don't know. I got to make sure I put that in the IRB. So the cadets ran. What we did, we looked at 80% max heart rate, ran them for 30 minutes on a treadmill. Guess what? Uh, absolutely outstanding data, 99.4%. I had no misses. I had some mislocalization. So they said, hey, I think I felt that tactor. It was actually this tactor. Well, I can deal with that because, number one, it was only 0.6% that they ever did that. Number two, if we're talking about localizing a target or running in a direction, I can take 22 and a half degrees off. In fact, if you look at everybody knows in the visual attention literature, 45 degrees is all you need to get actually maximize uh, attentional cueing in a large visual search field. So we're very happy about the results here. Zero errors as far as recognizing your arm and hand signals. We only used four, though rally, attention, uh, halt, and, some, and uh, nuclear biological chemical attack. Um, yeah, they just ran faster when you did that <laughs> one. Actually, all right, I got to tell some funny stories here as we go. So this was a neat study. Got to go down with Beth Redden and Linda, uh, Linda Elliott down at Fort, uh, Fort Benning. Took cadets out, or took uh, soldiers right out of AIT who already knew arm and hand signals. Did a study to see how well they could actually attend to these while doing military movement, so doing obstacles, low crawling, high crawling, climbing over walls, and um, let's see if I can make the laser work here. This guy would represent a team leader. This guy would represent a squad leader. So when you walk in patrol, you're supposed to constantly be looking for the enemy, for the IED, for whatever is your mission, but you also watch your team leader in front of you, and you watch your squad leader behind you, and you're expected to pick up visual commands from people behind you. That's just your responsibility. That's how it works. So we did a one-to-one head-to-head -one -head test. Signals came from the front, meaning arm and hand signals. Signals came from the rear, and signals also came from the tactile belt that you were wearing underneath all your equipment. Okay, uh, I don't, I don't have a slide because I wasn't gonna. I, I, I have other data I want to show. Here's the bottom line: tactile one every single time. Now, uh, back up for a second, though. I, here's what I will you back up one slide. I don't want to. Uh, this is something I, I got really kind of serious about. Tactile wasn't going to replace visual signals. Tactile is there to augment visual signals. 
you don't need to read my lips. You only need to read my lips when you can't hear me. So the whole idea is we can augment vision. We can augment audition. The whole reason we have arm and hand signals is to augment audition. So tactile can augment both of them. Um, when you're low crawling on the ground, you, you don't look up. So literally, tactile beats front arm and hand signals. The only one tactile became equivalent to was if you gave an arm and hand signal and you were looking down the sight post of your weapon. So if you were looking dead at your team leader, you could get it fast visual. You could get it just as fast visually as you could tactilely. But climbing walls, you don't tend to look forward. Guess what? It beat hands down the arm and hand signals in the back. Now, we were going to do a night iteration of this. I didn't really see the need. I thought tactile probably would win at night, not using night observation devices. You can't see your squad leader. You can't see your team leader at night. So, okay. That was supposed to be funny. All right, so next slide. <laughs> now, th this is where I love telling this one. So then we wanted to see what about inside a vehicle. So we have the Bradley fighting vehicle. We have a Humvee. This is at uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds. They have a very nice simulation there in the a ARL HRED. And so this vehicle, this could replicate the frequency of a, a track vehicle, a wheeled vehicle, et cetera. Um, wanted to use soldiers on this. The problem is that it wasn't safety certified for soldiers, so we had to use civilians. And uh, <laughs> that also was supposed to be funny, but it's true. So we use we we use civilians. Absolutely great resolution. Again, they were able to get the signal well over 80 percent accuracy. This we just did localization tasks, but it worked. So Dr. Hancock said, "Get busy." So I did. We took five signals. We did we digitized them or we made them tactile. Ran some students through. I'm going to talk specifically. We looked at confusion trials, meaning what happens when vision doesn't mit match. What you feel when you see doesn't match what you feel. The McGurk effect, actually, we call it in vision and audition. Did a bunch of neat stuff. I'm just going to go over some of the data real quickly. Here's what it looks like. A guy we know doing arm and hand signals, a little video of him, carefully temporally matched to the arm and hand signals. So it either was attention, halt, move out, NBC rally. So we'd present it. The subject as quickly as possible would identify what it was. Here's what happens. They did very, very well, well over 80% in every, in every uh, condition. So here's what happens. This is if it was visual as in blue, meaning they just saw me doing the arm and hand signal. This is yellow, meaning they just felt the signal. And if you mix blue and yellow together, you get green. So this is when they did both of them together. What ends up happening is when you, I call this the congruency effect, when you can see it and you can feel it, you suddenly become faster than when you can just feel it or just see it. This is why multimodality is so important. This is why if we can give the soldier the van a chance to hear it, if we can give the soldier a chance to see it, and now if we can give the soldier a chance to feel it, all those work greatly, great potentially independently, but I think they work even better all together. Now, obviously, I didn't do an audition part. I was trying to finish the dissertation in time. We didn't look at audition. So I want to show you one more slide. This is just accuracy. No real difference between the visual accuracy and then the two together. However, you clearly got a benefit when you, when you put them both together with tactile. And there was a difference between the visual and tactile. It did take, I mean, there was a learning curve. You didn't get it every single time. And we're getting better at building the signal because some of our signals were confusing. And once you've created confusion, then there, there's issues. One of the DARPA projects I'm working on now is how can we expand that language. We're going to try to make it a little bit more, intuit, more intuitive. We think it's pretty intuitive now, but see how far we can press it. And now we've got to worry about mode error. Am I telling you to run in this direction? Am I telling you to shoot the enemy in this direction? Or I'm just trying to tell you that you need to scratch your belly in that direction. I mean, there's lots of things we can say. We've got to make sure that we're not creating mode error. So we're really trying to see how we can advance the language. And uh, also what we haven't done is looked at this under high cognitive stress. Lots of physi physiological stress. Now we're going to start looking at this under high cognitive stress. Excited about where the future is heading us. Lots of cadets are working on these projects as well. What I was going to tell you about Darkett's study, he's looking now, oh, by the way, when you do this gesture, he can capture that movement. Now you have it in the network. I can send it audition. I can hopefully, visually, it was already out there, and now I can send it tactile. And with my commander's dashboard, I'm now really stretching it. I can figure out which mode he or she needs it in and give it to him in that mode. Right? It really wouldn't be the dashboard, but same algorithm kind of stuff. So this is how it all feeds in. This is how I see it from the applied side. I don't want to take questions, so I have to hurry. Uh, interesting, I pulled this slide from Fort Benning. This is kind of talking about, this was actually a year before the human dimension stuff came out. But they talk about see, smell, and feel the battlefield. 
So I, I was ahead of my time right there. I'm already trying to make it where you can feel the battlefield. Um, neat part about it is we're already heading this direction. We'll have the systems all there ready for the soldier. The power will be there. The connectivity will be there. What we got to do is make sure we race ahead of time and make sure the language is there. Uh, and I think that's where we're headed with the ground soldier system. But I want to take time for questions. So Carla's looking at me, and I know the cadets are getting ready to throw me off the stage. So questions, please. Sir, uh, Cadet Nate Drake, I'm in your class. Uh, I told you, no questions. Go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, no, no. <laughs> please, please ask a question. All right, sir. Uh, so in the beginning of your presentation, you talked about all of the networks of information that are possible. And the technology we certainly know is there to send all that information out to soldiers. But what do you feel is the consequence of flat, flattening a necessarily hierarchical chain of command structure that is the Army? So making it more horizontal instead of like an S2 talking to a commander, talking to an S3, instead you just have an S3 shooting out, you know, email or some other form of communication horizontally as opposed to up and down it, the chain of command. It's a, it's a great question, Nate, and let me answer it in two ways. F first way is, we, for example, with the ar incoming artillery, the ability to go through the chain of command is not there. We don't have the time. So the ability to, to get that information to the individual soldier and tell them to run like crazy to get out of the probable error, I think we have to do that. We owe that to the individual soldier, absolutely. Do we very much reserve the right to do that only when it's absolutely necessary for life or limb? Yes, because squad leaders don't need their guys up and running in a certain direction without taking maybe that instruction from the squad leader. Squad leader needs to kind of know an intent of what his or her men or, or, or women are doing, so we got to be careful. The second piece of that, though, commander's dashboards, and it kind of goes related to what our uh, anthropologist, anthropologist, is that right, said? Um, it's not about looking at that display in a vacuum and saying, well, I, already, I know better than the commander does because I have access to all this information that he or she doesn't. What that allows a higher level commander to do is make an assessment that maybe the person on the ground doesn't have access to. And so it goes back to my idea with multimodality. Tactile doesn't replace vision. Tactile doesn't replace audition. It augments it. Commander's dashboard does not take away the responsibility of the lower level soldiers and leaders to make decisions. What it does is it gives the higher leader another component to make sure that he or she is informing the lower level, oh, by the way, I know some things you don't know. Did you know, by the way, that your guys are, while they are extremely motivated, they're spent. So with awesome power, I hate to use the Spider-Man analogy as well again, but with awesome power becomes awesome responsibility. So as we have this greater knowledge on high, we have to be responsible the way we use it, and we can't blindlessly then make those decisions. However, running out of the way of an artillery round, I think a squad leader is willing to take that little bit of loss of control to save lives. Hopefully that answers your question. 